Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As we prepare for this session, I think this is the first session of the day, and it's all about big data. Now, my name's Graham Hansel. I'm here today on behalf of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, and my role is to try and give you some insight and some background to how big data can actually be applied to your real customers today, and the sort of planning you're going to need to be making over the next 12 to 18 months to incorporate big data into your organisation. Now, what I will say is, having prepared for this uh, session this morning, is big data is hot. There's no doubt about it, I'm seeing at least 5, 10, 15 articles every day being published on big data. It really is a major topic of interest for 2013, and it's a phrase you're not going to get away from. But what I'm trying to do in this session this morning is to give you a, a little bit of a how to rationally and sa sanely approach big data rather than just get caught up in all the hype and importantly plan how you can actually gain something for your business from the use of big data rather than just investing heavily in a major IT spend and hoping for the best. Now, to kick off the presentation. So, big data, it's a new hope. It's what we've got for 2013 that's going to solve all of our ills. Unfortunately, one of the things I would say about big data, it has, shall we say, um, a history which is associated with other forms of prediction. First of all, weather forecasting. We all know about that. Did you know a third of all searches in the world for the word weather occurs in the UK? We love the weather in the UK. We can't get enough of it. So, our weather forecasting should be pretty good. Well, a year ago, well, April actually, last year, we were told that we were, going to, we were in drought and that we had hose pipe bans. And then followed immediately afterwards by the second wettest summer on record, actually year on record. So in terms of our forecasting in weather, it hasn't been, shall we say, the best average. So, and that is big data at its finest. Some of the largest computer systems in the world are being used by NASA and also organizations like the Met Office to actually look at weather patterns and actually do some prediction which has any value to it beyond five to seven days. So that's big data in effect. Another example of big data and forecasting, business intelligence. Unfortunately, business intelligence was something from the last decade that was going to change all enterprises and make them more efficient, more powerful, more incisive, and be able to make more with less. Now, only 24% of companies actually have any form of business intelligence at all inside their organisation, and most of those are unclear, according to surveys, as to how much it actually earns them. Another form of major predictive analysis, financial analytics. Now, we all remember 2008 and the situation that everyone got into there, which was very much based around the ability to predict future trends in markets and be able to hedge against it. And then finally, we have big data marketing. It's the new future. It's what we're all going to be able to identify our customers want, need, and prepare for what they are aiming to do with themselves at every point, be it offline or online, and the main purpose of it is, is to generate your company more revenues and to make yourselves as a marketeer look like a hero. Unfortunately, big data is going to have to take its place in, shall we say, less than illustrious partners in terms of forecasting and prediction. Predicting the future. It's tricky. As this quote from Niles Borson puts it, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. It's a real issue. We all want to be able to control the future. We all want to be able to see exactly what's coming up. And we all want to be, feel secure in our day-to-day -day jobs that the money we're spending and the investment decisions we're making in marketing are going to pay the company back. Unfortunately, that isn't normally true in terms of the, real, the reality of what actually comes out of the predictions. Unfortunately, what we have to deal with is a sane implementation of data rather than just far and forget and hope and wait and see. So today, big data is a big opportunity for all of you, but we need to approach it in a smart way. And I'll go on and describe some of those ways as we go through. Now, this gentleman, Nassim Talib, anyone heard of him? He wrote Black Swan. Black Swan predicted the 2008 crash. He's a former, uh, I think, currency trader in New York and a very smart guy. Uh, I read Black Swan summer 2007, freaked me out, and then uh, unfortunately didn't really do a lot about it. 
um, following year all went very badly wrong and we all learned that in actual fact that there might have been something to that book. He's now written a new book called Anti-Fragile. Again, very interesting book, how companies, organisations, systems, human systems need to be able to be built to actually sustain shock and surprise rather than being able to plan your way out of every eventuality. So it's about building robust systems and big data is part of that. But from this quote, unfortunately, his view on big data is it allows the unusual to appear as usual and for people to be able to cherry pick from big data to exactly what they want. In other words, it's just a bigger set of cards that you, you build your hand out of and you can find whatever you like out of big data analysis. So what is really important for everyone with big data is to understand the questions you want to ask and what benefit you'll gain from having those questions answered, rather than seeing big data like some crystal ball which people look into and in actual fact it, it only reflects their own needs, wants and desires out of their position inside the business. So it's important to realise this isn't going to replace a person, this isn't going to replace insight. Big data is only an ability for you as an organisation to be able to see more of the 360 degree view of your customer and their behaviour and needs and wants rather than saying to yourself, this is going to replace what we are doing at the moment. This is an adjunct, this is an add-on. One of the big things when you're dealing with any form of data, and having done SEO for the last 15, 16 years, this is something I, I yeah, regularly talk about when I'm talking to both clients and also inside my own agency, is that there's a big difference between correlation and causation in data. Correlation is when two random points happen to match up. So in other words, on one, on one scale you see a blip, on the on an upper scale you see another blip. There's no, that's just correlation. Causation is what you're looking for in big data. It's actually boiling the data down to one thing, an event, the cause, that then went on to produce a second event, the effect. Without that, and understanding that principle, those principles, it's too easy to look at data as a, a guide, when in actual fact it's just interpreting randomly aligned events. And when, we're, when, as I say, as an SEO, you look into Google and the way its algorithm changes and performs over time, you're constantly looking at impacts which you are always trying to decide, is it causal, or is it just a correlation of data? So, and it's only going to get worse for all of us because what I've been dealing with for the last 15 years in SEO and trying to look into the unfathomable algorithm of Google is now going to become part of everyone's day-to-day -day life as data becomes more and more part of how all marketeers are going to be behaving. Now, definitions. One of the big things today with big data is its definition of size. Anyone know here how many rows you can get inside of an Excel table? There's a million, just over a million rows. So that's about as big as most marketeers actually get or have the ability to manage. Excel is the, is the marketeer's friend. So in that case then, we're actually talking at in what is known as bytes, kilo, mega, gigabytes of data. That's what most marketeers deal with. Big data, according to IDC is actually measured as starting at 100 terabytes and above. In other words, it's really big. And this, being able to deal with all of this information and then actually turning that into some sort of actionable insight is really where we, as an industry, need to start focusing. Now, this doesn't mean we all need to lead some major IT explosion and investment explosion. And I'll be able to talk a bit more about that. But the sort of data that marketeers are, going to, are, are and will be dealing with are really measured in new terms like Petra, Exa, Zeta, and this is a new word on me even, is Zotta, Bytes. This is really, really big data. So if we think in terms of Excel, and it only does a million rows, which is less than a gig of data, we're talking huge systems and huge ability to produce real insights inside of some reasonable time scale. One of the problems with big data is it offers this opportunity to try and get to the truth. The issue is, is it's not about discovering truth, 
is about discovering something useful and something inside of a time frame that you can actually do something about it. You're not all turning into accountants who look back over the last 12 months and come to a decision on one day what, what was important about a particular organisation. As marketeers, we need to be dealing with huge amounts of data and producing it inside of a really powerful re results inside of a time frame that affect the business. Not just leaving it to run to, for months and months and months before you can come up with an answer. So, I sound very negative about big data, but there are some distinct successes already out there. And I try to pick ones that are in the UK, because normally what you find when you're talking about most technical systems, you're talking about US-based companies. So I found three here, which actually have used big data today, and are investing heavily in big data to create some real market differentiation for their enterprises. The first one, BBC, invests heavily in big data. They have two questions that they're constantly challenging themselves with. This is according to their CTO, John Linwood, in uh, an article recently. Two interests, understanding their audience behavior and how they're interacting with us. So this, as the BBC, are investing in, and constantly increasing their ability to use big data to answer those two questions. Another example, Just Eat. Who's heard of Just Eat? This is the takeaway company, thank you, some people are, have heard of them. This is the takeaway company. They actually act as an aggregator for your local takeaways in whichever town or city you live in and enable these local um, food emporiums, um, possibly involved in the uh, horse meat scandal recently, but anyway, moving on from there, importantly, it enables them to take online bookings and mobile bookings in a way they've never been able to do before. Now there's a very good, uh, really, you know, interview with a presentation from Paul Cook, who's their head of Global Insight, and he makes the point that it's not about developing a 360 degree view of your customer, because his view is it takes too long. What you need to do is take 10% of the time and del deliver the 80% degree review of your customer. In other words, 288 degree review. What does that mean? You get enough of what you need to know quickly enough to make a difference. Trying to get to perfection, again, is unfortunately not inside of the role of big data or what a marketeer should be doing. You need the 10, 20% that gets you 80% of the way there and then move on. And then finally, Wonga.com. We've all seen their ads, they're on TV with those annoying puppets, they're on the side of buses, they're on the tube, they're in papers, they're all over mobile. And Wonga.com was built out of the concept of big data. Wonga.com took 100,000 applications in its first startup phase to develop a model for who looks like a profile that will actually produce reasonable repayment terms. What they were doing, they're building their own underwriting profile. And they use big data from day one to do this. And what's interesting about Wonga, they started, I think, 2007, London-based company, started by a South, South African gentleman. He produced a view which said, rather than just saying, what is the history, let's look at all the other data and signals that we can see. So, social media data was brought in from day one inside of Wonga's view. It looks at what people publicly say about themselves and what their, what their behavior is. So in other words, if someone is constantly posting pictures of them on holiday, or if they're constantly posting pictures of new cars, then it, surprisingly, Wonga can pick up on this information and actually add that to a profile of you. Now, this information is publicly accessible. It's what we're all putting into Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn even on a day-to-day -day basis. And Wonga as a business centered around this. Now, whether I'm not here to discuss the ethics around payday loans, but as a company, that is really powerful, actionable big data from day one. And they've built their entire and they're turning over hundreds of millions of pounds. So they're doing quite nicely out of this positioning. So these three examples that are using big data in a way that today you as an organisation may or may not be able to adopt, but importantly you can learn from them. One of the things that we are all seeing today is an explosion in data points on the customer and the consumer. So on the left hand side here, you've got, you know, for the last 15 years you've been able to collect web browsing data on people. But now it's getting to a point where you're not just looking at web browsing on 
desktops and tap that, but you're also looking at mobiles and tablet information. And being able to bring that data together, again, becomes a very important aspect of your data collection. But that produces, again, huge amounts of data. Social media. The explosion of social media is actually being noted for the first time in history. People, us, consumers, the public, are now creating more data than companies are. So we, the public, are actually producing more data as individuals collectively than all of the companies and organisations that are out there. And that's the first time that's happened. So, and this is because of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and the social networks that people are always using. So the data is exploding. So, and you've got all the other aspects, such as geo-tracking, being able to identify, like, I'm stood here, if my GPS is on, that obviously identifies exactly where I am. If, even if my GPS isn't on, then the, um, the cell tower locations will give me a rough locator inside of this space. It's interesting that, you know, for instance, Google, and we've all heard about Street View, and the fact that they've mapped all the Wi-Fi points, and they got into a lot of trouble for not doing this properly in 2008, but mapping all the Wi-Fi access points inside of many countries around the world. They did that because they realised GPS was fallible. It's not a necessarily good, strong indicator of location. But if you couple GPS with Wi-Fi location, you get very strong, robust data very quickly. Google is a very smart company. They do make mistakes, there's no doubt about it. But they're very smart. And that technology that they developed back then has only now just started being rolled out by the military, the US military, because they realised that exactly the same problem was happening. GPS data is fallible. There's a great story where I think it was um, San Diego Airport. Every day, about half past four, the, uh, all the GPS used to go out, half four, all the time, and they just couldn't work out how they lost all their GPS signal across the whole air, um, across the whole airport. And what it turned out was that there was one guy who was driving home at that time of day who had a GPS blocker in his car because he was sick of his boss knowing exactly where he was when he was out on his sales rounds. Every day he drove past the airport and the entire GPS signal went out. You can buy these off the internet, not surprisingly, you can buy most things off the internet. But you're in that position now where the data needs to be built to a level where it's far stronger and less fallible than just single data points. So again, going back to the big data concept, your volumes exponentially increase. So you need, you've need you also got all the aspects of data being collected through call centers as well as points of sale. To bring them together, you've got this new selection of tools which are mainly open source tools, mainly built off either Facebook or Google technology, which is being open sourced, in other words, made freely available, to enable people to deal with these huge volumes of data. My advice to you, though, is if, you, if your organization is talking about in actually bringing these in-house and doing it yourselves, then you must have a very strong business case for it, because this is very expensive stuff. The view, and I've read a lot of articles recently and spoken to quite a few people about this, the view isn't big data, it's smart data. And the way for you to be able to try and tell the difference is a litmus test, both huge amounts of data. But if you're talking about building a new priesthood inside your company who are based around data scientists and um, big data experts, you're possibly, unless you've got a very strong business case for it, going in the wrong direction. If you're trying to deal with all of this information in-house, again, you may be going in the wrong direction. Smart data applications tend to have a profile of, again, huge amounts of data, but they produce simple outputs. You don't need to build this new data elite inside your organization. And I know if you're part of that data elite, of course, that's what you want to do. But the truth is, as an organization, you need to be building it so Anyone inside of cybers can take insights from this data and do something with it. There's no point having all of this insight being built if no one does anything with it. You're not a research institution, you're an organisation hopefully producing profit. And then finally, looking at using all of the very, very low cost storage available today in cloud. Cloud based solutions for storage seem to be the only sensible way to go, certainly unless you have a unique business proposition. If, for instance, someone like Wonga may or may not be using cloud storage, but they're certainly keeping that data that they've built for their underwriting purposes very close to themselves as an organisation. So you need to balance it, 
you need to understand your own risks and rewards from it, but this isn't, should never be led by IT. Big data, it should not be owned by IT. It needs to be owned by the business, and it needs to be owned by the, the marketeers who are leading that business to higher growth and more benefit for their customers. Now here's a, a new acronym for you, OODA. Never said that in public before. OODA, right, so, comes from the military. Military strategist John Boyd. He, his day job is for the um, United States Air Force. And he's developed this thinking to enable combat pilots to get inside of the OODA of their enemy. So the thinking here is you need to observe. So this is a process of how you should be acting on your big data insights. You observe it, you orientate yourself, make sure you're, you're facing in the right direction. For pilots, that'll be up, down, left, right, wherever. Decide, so that's simple, actually come up with a hypothesis as to what's happening and what is all this information telling you. And most importantly, action, or as it's, as it's shown in this diagram here, if you can read it on screen, test. So one of the things I've seen recently coming out of big data is the idea of big testing. So it's not just about having lots and lots of data and even getting lots and lots of insight. It's about how do you rapidly test that, in, that insight to get to real truth about what's happening out there. So big data in itself is not going to stand on its own and be able to tell you all the answers. Again, as an organization, you've got to do something with it. So this OODA process is very much how it's now being seen as the way that you need to be looking as an organization to actually implement your big data schemes. So I pulled this off um, Alistair Kroll. He's uh, working for O'Reilly, which is a very smart publisher, uh, in something called the, the Strata Online Program. He's the chair of it. And this is his three big tips for organizations getting into big data. Learn to ask the right questions. Don't just do the cherry picking that back up either the gut instincts of the learned history or the politics of your organization. Ask the hard questions that may just change something and get your organization to grow. Change how you think about data. Now this is very hard. Opening it up, getting accounts to talk to marketing, getting sales to share with marketing, getting everyone to share with marketing, marketing sharing with everyone else. Rather than having the thiefdoms and silos of the past, and this is so easy to say and so hard to do, it's actually about breaking down those walls and getting some real view as to what the customer is doing with you as an organization all the way around. Not just sales and marketing, but as I say, accounts, business, PR, any point of contact with the organization, investor relations, everything. It's all got data that can be shared and add to this 360 degree view. And then finally, it's about this being able to react quickly to things. So this goes back to Google's own phrase, which is fail fast. It's being able to make your organization know that when things start happening, they're going to happen quickly. And this isn't quarterly and yearly planning time here. This is when the insights come up. What are you as an organization going to do? So going through, approaching it from an OODA thinking, and then saying, how are you going to apply? And no single tool is going to do that for you. What you're talking about here is, with most things in business nowadays, it's about business transformation. It's about making, if you're an established business, make yourself more agile and flexible. If you're a new startup, it's about taking the ability to use today's technology and the future technology and put yourself into a very strong business position to be able to defend your niche. And then finally, to show you that this isn't just hype and theory, some real world big data tools. One of the ones that probably all of you or at some point have run across at some point is Google Analytics. Google Analytics is a big data tool. It has petrobytes of data in it and that was back in 2006. No one actually knows apart from the engineers themselves how much data is inside of Google Analytics today. But it's certainly going to be in one of those other words. Um, what I will tell you now is Google Analytics is an awesome tool at producing insightful information. If you know, if you're trained how to use it, but it doesn't take a data scientist to use it, you just need a data training, and you can get some really insightful information out of Google Analytics. Now that's great if you're doing web marketing, but what happens if you're not just doing web marketing, but you're multi-channel? Well, Google's got an answer for that. 
what they're doing this year, so probably about summer this year, they're actually releasing universal analytics. Where rather than it just collects data from your website, it, you as an organization can put data free of charge into the Google Analytics Cloud and be able to analyze that. So that's everything from banner advertising data, that could be Facebook advertising data, that could be Bing advertising data, all the way through to your CRM data, and also the data that's going to be coming out of your point of sale systems. Can all be now, oh, over this year, will all be able to be uploaded into Google Analytics and using the same reasonably simple interface be able to bring some real insights that you can start actually actioning in as organizations. And the power of that is the fact that you, the investment is very low cost. Free. It's not a bad level. But what you need to be aware of is obviously you're now sharing your data with this third party, Google, and it's about your own organization's trust of working with partners. Another example that you can all use today is something called Google Trends. Now, this map here that shows here, Google Trends is a, analyzes all the billions of queries that are typed into Google and is a big data marketing tool that you can all use today. It's free of charge, just go to google.com slash trends and you can type in and see how people search on any topic under the sun, anywhere around, around the world in over, I think, about 100 odd languages. Again, big data marketing tool, simple output, something that you can actually produce some real insight with. Now that is smart data. There's no point stacking up you know, arrays of disks and building new server farms and getting all this new team in who are going to become major insight data insightful individuals if you know, ultimately the people inside the organization are just building themselves a new group of people to hold themselves to ransom. You need to be looking at tools that you implement that give you simple outcomes that are actionable. Other examples, if you want to do it yourself, um, if you want to go beyond their, their tools, you can use Google's BigQuery tool. Again, that has a, is, there's a cost implication in this, but the good BigQuery tool is what drives these other tools. So if you want to do your own analysis, then you can actually push your data today into the Google BigQuery. Now you're getting into an IT project there, this isn't something that you just approach as a marketeer and start uploading Excel spreadsheets into but it is available to you and has a, a heavy amount of lifting potential for organizations. But it's not just Google doing this at all. Facebook has new tools that have come out and as have in the, pay, in the search engine marketing area, a wide range of third parties have produced very powerful tools around SEO and also paid search. So big data is driving serious business investments today, whether we look and realize it or not. Another example of a third party, independent company, very interesting company I've used for years is gooddata.com. This allows you to upload data from Salesforce or from Google Analytics and mash it all together. They call them bash it up. And then you bash it up into a form that you can get a lot of real actionable insights out of it. Gooddata.com is a, a very powerful tool and again is an example of real big data marketing in action today. We're finally talking about Salesforce, Salesforce has its own big data store. That's called data.com, or a nice domain name there. And they've got data.com works with big, works inside of your Salesforce tool to actually produce big data insights inside of it. They've also invested heavily in the last few years in their marketing cloud, where they bought Radiant 6 and also Buddy Media to bring together insights of any brand searches, any brand mentions that are happening out there in the world, online, and being able to bring it back into your Salesforce CRM system. So finally, to summarize this, there's a lot to learn. Obviously, I'm here today speaking on behalf of the CIM. We run courses and there's, you'll see, on your seats, there's actually a handout here which outlines three of the courses that are recommended that are coming up in the near future around big data for marketeers, but it is, to me, it's about really looking at smart data marketing. Otherwise, you're just generating new IT projects for people who necessarily don't necessarily make any money for the organization. Unfortunately, a lot of this, again, comes down to changing the company, which is all, seems to be more and more the challenge for the marketeer in so many companies. It's about breaking down the data silos, and as, a, as this new acronym, UDAR, 
is actually learning to implement that as individuals as well as an organisation. Being able to act on these insights rather than just generate insights. And then finally, looking for these smart tools. Start off with the tools that are already out there and used by many people and understand what is really powerful about them. And it, what, the commonality between them is that it gives anyone who picks them up something of value. That's when you know you've got a smart data tool rather than just a big data tool.